The sauropods that ruled the late Jurassic may have been done in partly by the rise of the ornithopods. One of the earliest known dinosaurs, Pisanosaurus, appears to be a basal ornithopod, but this group remained relatively small in the late Jurassic. Even the largest ornithopods, like Camptosaurus, were merely 5 meters or 16 feet long. The most notable developments in the ornithopod lineage was the evolution of their dentitions and jaws. Within this group of dinosaurs, the most efficient chewing mechanism ever developed in vertebrates evolved. One notable early ornithopod clade is the heterodontosaurs. They are some of the only dinosaurs to develop a heterodont dentition. We as mammals are strange among vertebrates as far as our teeth go. We have differently shaped teeth depending on where they occur in our jaws. Everything else, reptiles, amphibians, fish, birds, back when birds had teeth, typically had similarly shaped teeth, regardless of where they are in the mouth. Heterodontosaurs develop a dentition very similar to that of mammals, with incisiform teeth at the front of the mouth for slicing, and caniform teeth adjacent to the incisiform row and molariform teeth to form a grinding surface in the cheek region of the jaws. Another notable ornithopod clade is the hypsilophodonids. These were also small and retained primitive skeletal features. This, however, is where we see the advanced mechanics of ornithopod chewing appear. Their maxillae, or upper jaw bones, flexed with each motion as hypsilophodonids move their jaws. This phenomenon, called pleurokinesis, allowed them to grind their upper and lower teeth across whatever they were chewing by simply moving their jaws in a scissor motion. As mammals, our own skulls are rigid, so to use our molars for grinding food, we have to gyrate our jaws, which is much less efficient. If you are a fan of beef jerky, you're probably aware of how quickly your jaw muscles can get worn out after working them on a tough piece of meat for a while. It is this pleurokinetic efficiency that allowed ornithopods to effectively chew their food, preparing it for simple digestion after it was swallowed. These dinosaurs had no need for fermentation vats or gastroliths since they were able to mechanically process plant material, breaking open cellulose cell walls manually rather than letting rocks in a crop mill things down like herbivorous theropods or using any extraordinary stomach flora or chemistry to break down these cell walls like sauropods did. The ornithopod group that came to dominate the Cretaceous was the hadrosaurs or duck-billed dinosaurs as you have probably heard them called. They inherited the craniokinesis of hypsilophodonid skulls and brought to it the advanced dental battery adaptation that would make them the kings of all chewing competitions. As the name suggests, the front of hadrosaur skulls resembled the rounded, spoon-shaped bills of ducks. Their premaxillae on top and predenaries below were toothless and shovel-shaped for scooping up or plucking mouthfuls of whatever plants or algae looked tasty. They had no need to worry about wearing their teeth out chewing dirt-covered food because they had dozens to hundreds of teeth in each jaw, forming a pavement that was effectively a single, flat milling surface. I should mention here that predenary bones are unique to ornithischian dinosaurs, so sauritians, like theropods and sauropods, did not have anything separating their lower denaries. This sometimes makes me wonder if sauritian dinosaurs may have been able to branch out with their dentitions more had they not lacked predenaries. Another feature that should be pointed out about ornithopod dinosaurs is that, other than some theropod groups, this is the only group in which we find evidence of parental care for hatchlings. 
This investment in the next generation is a relatively rare thing for reptiles. Primitively, reptiles are what we would call our selected organisms. They produce many offspring, and there is relatively little parental care or investment. Most of these offspring will never make it into adulthood and are essentially fodder for predators to keep the more fit individuals in the gene pool long enough to produce the next generation. The opposite of R selection is K selection. And we're talking little r and big K, so uncapital and capitalized. K selected species are like us. We invest greatly in the next generation, expecting most of them to survive to adulthood. Judging from the degree of parental care, at least apparent in fossil nests of some ornithopods, we can see that these dinosaurs were at least straddling the fence between R and K selection. Their hatchlings were not precocious and appear to have spent extensive amounts of time in the nest after hatching. Adults would have needed to supply these hatchlings with food until they could make it out on their own. These nests do show a number of eggs being hatched at once, and we know that hadrosaurs herded together in very large numbers, so there were certainly a number of young that were destined to be picked off before they became parents themselves. The dinosaur clade, for which nesting behavior remains a complete mystery, is the Thyreophora, or armored dinosaurs. No eggs or nests directly attributable to Thyreophorans have been found yet. The Thyreophorans, other than a few primitive examples, can be divided into three main clades, the Stegosaurs, Ankylosaurs, and Notosaurs. Notosaurs are essentially ankylosaurs that lack the famous tail club that is a hallmark of the ankylosaurs. Other than a unique group of Asian sauropods like Shunosaurus, no other dinosaurs seem to have developed anything like the tail clubs of ankylosaurs. The armor that this group is named for comes in a variety of dermal ossifications, which would have been covered with horn-like keratin in life a material like what our finger and toenails are composed of. Dermal ossifications are different from bones that form as part of our skeletons. They are bones that form in the ectoderm tissue layer rather than the mesoderm tissue layer that the vertebrate skeleton develops from. This is a feature that appears even in the most primitive thyreophorans, which were small and bipedal like Scutellosaurus. By the late Jurassic, large, quadrupedal, heavily armored thyreophorans roamed alongside the enormous sauropods and the huge predatory carnosaurs that evolved to prey on those sauropods. The armor was no doubt crucial to the persistence of thyreophorans in this world of competition and fierce predation. It likely served a number of purposes for the various armored dinosaurs that sported it. Stegosaurs are noted for their large dorsal plates that erupted from their backs along either side of their neural spines. These plates would have been at the ideal height to be right in the face of any Allosaurus or Torvosaurus it may have run into on a dark game path. The end of the tails of stegosaurs also had large dermal ossifications, but rather than being flat plates, these were sharp, heavy spikes that would have left a two-inch hole in whatever they happened to fully penetrate. These spikes are named thagomizers, as cartoonist Gary Larson jokingly named them in one of his beloved paleontology-themed single-frame comics. In addition to serving as predator deterrents, the plates of stegosaurs could have helped passively regulate body temperature by catching more heat when basking and shedding heat in the breeze and possibly changing color to absorb or reflect heat more efficiently as the dinosaur needed. As I mentioned, ankylosaurs had tail clubs rather than the spikes that stegosaurs had. Along with notosaurs, ankylosaurs had more of a tortoise-like carapace in ways, 
with armor potentially erupting from any point dorsal to the lateral margins of their bodies. These more plate-like ossifications are traditionally called scutes. That's S-C-U-T-E-S, not S-C-O-O-T-S. It does sound like they could scoot around on their scoots if they wanted to, but they would have to be laying on their backs to do so. The more plate-like armor of ankylosaurs and notosaurs can seem benign compared to the spikes on the tails of stegosaurs, but some ankylosaurs had very large spike-shaped scoots above their shoulders. Most paleontologists think all thyreophorans were essentially herbivorous. There is a chance, though, that insectivory could have also played a role in their dietary strategies. The teeth of thyreophorans are rather small, so how they would have digested enough plant material alone to get sufficient nutrition seems a mystery. The first colonizing insects, like termites and wasps, appear in the fossil record at this time in the late Jurassic. So those tail clubs and spikes would have been like a key to the cooler full of insect protein. Also, thyreophorans have mysteriously large hyoid bones, the bones to which tongue muscles attach in the base of the throat. This may be evidence of an anteater-like lifestyle for these dinosaurs, bashing their way into insect colonies and slurping up the bugs, larvae, and any other tasty treats the bugs happen to have stored in there. 